All right. What about this microphone? College of Complexes will now come to order. My name is Tim. I'll be helping to present tonight. Uh, our official program was canceled, so we're changing it to another one. But first, let's cover the rules of the college. First rule is no one fool at a time. Second is no personal attacks. The college consists of the following format. First, there'll be a brief, uh, brief announcements period. Then we will have Charlie Paydock present his presentation on a his most important events in American history. Then we shall have a question and answer period. And then we shall have a rebuttal period where you can comment up to usually five minutes on. Let us uh, give a warm, rousing, well, round to Charlie Paydock for a good presentation made in the last minute. Charlie, if you're ready, we're yeah. on. Ready to go. Hey, this is a fun one. I enjoy doing this, and I hopefully think you'll enjoy listening to it. Uh, let's see. Uh, I always, you know, I was scheduling the speakers or attending the college. I always try to ascertain what the basic premise of the speaker is, and are they are they taking a position, and are they correct, and they have to defend it. What is their basic assertion? term I often use too much, perhaps. And her, Margaret's assertion was that <laughs> there's no change at all in the nation. And I started thinking about it, and then I reflected on this. This is a program we did a couple of years ago. And I've refreshed it in completely and entirely, but <laughs> I said there are plenty of incidences in US, U.S. history of significant changes which have taken place. Uh, some by design, some by uh, situation or accident, if you wish. Uh, but there certainly have been changes. Now, whether or not all of those changes have been positive or negative, I leave that up to you to decide. But we can look at all of these, and you can let me know. Now, the another thing is, we'd like to hear from you folks. What do you think was the most significant change, or a significant change, which has taken place in this country? If you don't feel there's been any changes, that's totally acceptable as well. You can be like Margaret, maintain that, you know, needed changes have not been made, or perhaps needed changes you'd like to talk about. But we'd like to hear from all of you, and we also would like to hear from some people who normally don't get up to speak. So, don't be shy. Uh, I'm tired of listening to some of these jamokes because <laughs> they've got nothing to say that I haven't heard this nonsense, but I'd like to hear some new people too. All right, let's take our, our trip here, but we can see Betsy Ross there. Uh, let's see if I get this working correctly. This, I believe, is a curriculum that should be adopted for all school children in the nation. I think this is accurate and true. And this would be edifying for any young person in the United States. And I think it should be adopted. But anyhow, yeah, the major change was uh, the fact that the continent on which our nation is uh, was effectively discovered. Uh, and shortly after that, uh, settlement commenced. And this certainly is a change. And that settlement has been in progress for some time. Uh, it certainly was a change to those indigenous people who lived here from Asia, but the Europeans have been coming here uh, in a steady flow for some time. And uh, that's what I mean. I'd like to begin, I think, with the first arrival, the people that eventually were going to become citizens, or at least their descendants, the citizens of the United States. Okay, the pioneers. Now one of the things, not only that developed in this nation, it was the westward movement. And it was fostered in some respects by, if you want, there's a lot of things about information, but uh, many of the people had artists that went out west however you define West, and painted real pretty pictures. These were very popular at the time. 
you find these artists in the National Gallery in Washington, George Stott and some other people, actually what they would do is they would go out and make sketches and then go back to the studio and make pictures so that they, these are idealized paintings. But people in those days, uh, gallery openings were a big thing because they didn't have TV and, and YouTube uh, to watch and stuff like that. So Lutzstein paintings were, had a great larger significance. So it fostered in their minds of a nation and continent that was perfect and idyllic and wonderful. And they actually came up with a concept by a newspaper man like Butler who said the United Nations had a manifest destiny to settle the continent, to go from sea to signing sheets. See, that was later on. But uh, what opened up the colony, the major change, was the discovery, I lived down there and I've been through here many times, was the discovery over the Appalachian Mountains in the Cumberland Gap. And of course it settled along the eastern seaboard, but the first major change was the movement west. And a lot of people don't realize is that the American Revolution was fought largely because the British had enacted something called the Quebec Act and prohibited Western settlement. They, they, they left the French and the Indians to rule central, the, at that time, the central part of the country, or the Ohio country. Uh, it would incorporate the Midwest, and this ticked them off to no end because they fought it on the side and against the French, and they expected that partially the war was to open the frontier. And in fact, the British closed it down about 10 years before the American Revolution, but it was a contributing factor uh, to the American Revolution. It was probably the first thing that really, really, really got uh, the colonials upset with the British, because this effectively uh, cut them out of any westward settlement. Um, anyhow, expansion continued, but I, now the major change, we're talking about changes, is suddenly from this manifest destiny and ex, uh, expansionist, we've become completely the opposite. And from what I hear, there <coughs> isolationist feelings among the people, at least the, the Trumpers. And they cheer like, you know, the clothes. He went, now he's, and just this week, what is he talking about? Close the border. Close the border of the country of immigrants. This, this guy is not a concept. What he said, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to shut down the border. He doesn't even, want, doesn't even want commerce to cross the border. Material items, you know. It's one thing to, to restrict immigration, but that's not restrict trade. It's just like kind of nutty, you know. It's, it's completely imbalanced. Anyhow, and you see, I hope you can see here, that these are tips for customers, citizens only. You know, somebody takes this pretty seriously. Um, okay, uh, the change, the arrival of the settlers certainly was a change uh, to the inhabitants of this country, the Native Americans. Uh, they didn't quite know what, how to make, what to make out of this, you know. Uh, they certainly, uh, saw the advantages of the technology and the items that the, were provided in trade. Believe you me, an iron pot is, is of tremendous value, or a knife, and particularly a rifle if you're looking in the wilderness. You know. uh, but they, uh, they uh, the thing about this is, uh, the, the talk about change, they were confronted with a change of such a magnitude, you can't find Two cultures were two. They were so different than the Native Americans and the settlers. That there totally was no base. There's just no shared basis. They just couldn't understand what he was talking about. The cultures were so radically different, you know. But anyhow, um, the the other thing is uh, the portrayal of the Native the Indians here. Of course, uh, over time has, um, I don't know if it's changed, but it certainly was pretty bad in the, in, in the beginning, at least until quite recently, you know, they would use the term bloodthirsty savages. I was reading a book and the guy said, oh, we gotta settle the West. 
But the first thing we've got to do is get rid of the wild beasts and Indians. <laughs> so you, you know, uh, but anyhow, these are some of the toys uh, that you could play with. Um, the, uh, actually, this is probably accurate. The Iroquois were, I'm sorry, even among Indian tribes. People seem to think all Indian tribes are the same. You couldn't be more wrong. There are nice Indians in there. There are Lola. <laughs> and you find this in the journals of Lewis and Clark. Uh, and there are ones that are completely inhospitable. Uh, and to be honest with you, yeah, there's a big difference. But yeah, doing actually, that's what I mean. Not only did the settlers encounter Indians for the first time, but they encountered probably the worst ones. You would, yeah, that's how they left in the Russian. Okay, uh, just one other thing though. Uh, Regarding change, I think our change, I try to get sports fans like this guy here uh, to uh, change our attitudes uh, towards the, their uh, ideology regarding the Indians in this nation. I don't know, but that change is slowly taking effect. You know, but uh, I don't know, is Chief Rolinovic still running around? No, no, no. Uh, anyhow, there he was. And uh, look at these are this is, these are recent photos, the Redskin fans and, and some Cleveland boys <laughs> at the World Series. <laughs> okay, now one of the changes that took place, and I, I discovered this was um, Benjamin Franklin had a club for mutual improvement, and they went by various names, but the Junto uh, was changed and came forward. Uh, didn't exist before was uh, and they called it the Club of Leather Apron, um, meaning they were like tradesmen or guys who made things. It wasn't just intellectual. This were practical discussions here, but actually you could trace probably the lineage of the college complexes to a group such as this. Uh, Franklin later said that his group was pretty cool. And he said it improved the general conversation of the colonials. Yeah. All right. Um, there we go. Yeah, and eventually we got to college. So, I mean, that's, there's change going on. I mean, okay. Now, one of the changes that um, uh, I, I'm not of the military persuasion of warfare, but one of the major decisions or changes that took place, of course, was the decision to, to combat the, the British Empire. But the guy they chose was uh, significant. They couldn't have made a better choice. If you got to pick a general, George probably was the best uh, that you, you could do. I, and he deserves all that kind of stuff they give him at Mount Vernon and Blah. But uh, yes, he did very well. Uh, his aim, of course, he was correct. He took these ragtag lots, and his intention was to turn them into a traditional standard army. He was in charge of the Virginia Brigade before this, and they were considered the, the sharpest looking troops and the most, the most disciplined, called the Virginia Blues. And one of the things, the, the British made a mistake he actually wanted to be a, a, an officer in the British Army, but yet that wasn't going to happen because he was a colonial. They told him flat out, no, that's not going to happen. Like his first portrait was a portrait of him wearing a uniform. That's how he wanted to be identified. You know? But that, he had a group of, yeah, he had a thing against him. But anyhow, oops. Okay, the only thing that changes not only did we get this army out of it, but we got a military industrial complex, uh, which has lasted to this day. Uh, as you can see here, it's sucking up a significant about half the, if you want, at least about a third of the federal budget goes for uh, warfare and military, uh, if you want to generally converse about this. But this change has been going on in effect since inception of the country. It's also another change that's been extended on uh, the peace movement. People opposed to the militarization has extended to a new movement to uh, disarm the nation, or at least decrease the incident of violence in our communities. 
which I applaud. I've been involved in this for many years. Uh, yes, we, we need restrictions on weaponry. There's no conceivable reason. You know, I was reading about this kid. We're going to have the guy later on who's going to talk about that school, uh, Stony Hook. And to get the kids, the kid who did it, his mother owned an assault AK-47 or something like this. I don't know what, why, I just can't conceive of Why did she go, why would you like to go out and buy a weapon like that? I just, their son took it and used it, you know. But, <laughs> I just can't ascertain who would do this, you know. You bring one, I mean, you know, I, but I don't know. All right. Um, also, in the early part of our country, one of the changes that took place, certainly, was the secret societies started taking over the United States. There's all sorts of evidence of this. I often say uh, in uh, Alexandria, right near this uh, building, the Masonic headquarters, uh, you're Don Putin. There's all kinds of people that have discovered uh, these things. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the measurements are exact. You're telling me that happened by chance? Absolutely not. Anyhow, one of the changes that took place was that these guys took over the country and apparently are still operating in some fashion. I don't know to what extent. It's like, you know, it's a secret society, you know. But uh, anyhow, um, okay, and other changes that have taken, this change has taken place 47 or more times, that uh, all you people think capitalism is so great and operates flawlessly, oh, it's wonderful, right? it's improving our standard of living. That's, that's just not the case, you know. Um, Beginning in 1807, the country is relatively new. We started with these series of depressions and recessions, and they've been going on and on ever since. Uh, so anybody that tells you that capitalism is such a wonderful thing, it, it certainly there's nothing, nothing permanent about it. The fact is, is inherently, it seems they have an inherently some form of change is going to take place sooner or later. So I don't know what you, why you think this is such a cool system. Uh, when, as a matter of fact, given this, the failure rate of capitalism, which it is, I don't know why you would bother even trying it again as a methodology that you would use. It doesn't work. If I say I, if I failed 50 times, you don't say, well, let's do that again. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's completely ridiculous <coughs> to say. Well, we're gonna we're gonna maintain this, even though you know. Yeah, honestly. All right. Uh, another change that we came in. A lot of people don't realize that the oldest social movement in the United States is the organized labor movement. It began by some shoemakers. That's where they were. They made cobblers in Philadelphia in 1792, uh, and they engaged in the first act but it was considered collective bargaining. But um, they were journeymen. Um, and they, uh, and this, this has been fraught with change uh, throughout the history of the country. The change, they certainly, the, the unions have been an agent of change in many, many respects, uh, all for the good, I must say. So, there's plenty of change. Okay, another change that took place certainly was in the area of transportation that I dealt with many years. A lot of them people don't realize that the very infrastructure of the, na of the nation was changed. Right at the beginning, uh, there was an extensive canal system. You probably heard of the Erie Canal, there's the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, uh, the um, I&M Canal right here in Illinois. I think there was plenty of 2,000 miles of the canal about 40 foot ditch, 40 foot wide, about four feet deep. But they were, began to change the very infrastructure of the country. And these improvements, for some reason, the current administration doesn't see any significance or importance to this, but there are enormous stimulants to trade. 
and commerce. Certainly the Erie Canal that connected the Hudson River to the Erie was, as a matter of fact, there was such a successful event that one of the reasons the railroads came in is that there was a, the, the, you couldn't get, there was a backlog and there certainly there weren't enough vessels, room enough for all the vessels on some of the kills, actually. So these were very useful to the country and then they changed the nation uh, structure. Uh, the other thing, of course, following around, now sooner did they, uh, the problem with canals are they freeze in winter. And they're slower than old duck. You get them slow as a, horse, as a mule can walk because they're dragged by mules. And they're not very fast. So then the next improvement, of course, was uh, the railroad, which I'll be talking <coughs> about later. But uh, matter of fact, the first railroad in the United States was to parallel the, the CNO Canal from Baltimore to the, the Ohio River. Uh, so they, this was an improvement. Railroad trains are infinitely faster than tugboats. And, um, okay, the next change regarding continuing the theme of transportation, and this is, this was the incredible change, was the uh, uh, work done to complete the transcontinental railroad, uniting the nation from sea to siding sea. Uh, and uh, that was in 1869. Uh, this was a railroad built through the wilderness at the time, uh, financed by the government. People say, oh, no government projects. It was financed entirely by the government. By the way, talk about capitalism. The, the guy, who, the one guy, there were two companies that built it, one east and west. The guy who built the eastern part of the railroad was money nuts. He just was greedy. He just cheated and cheated, and any way he could get his hands on a dollar, he did. But it didn't work because you can see the date, 1869 and 1873. <coughs> there was one of these capitalist depressions, and he lost everything. So all his efforts, he cared nothing about railroading. It strictly was making money. He could care less. The matter of fact, it's kind of a funny story. He wasn't. He was the chairman, CEO, and they weren't building a railroad. And they said, finally, the government said, either you start building a railroad, or we're going to we're going to cancel the the contract. And then he started calling up everybody and ordering them to start building tomorrow. Why aren't you building a railroad? The day before, he didn't care. What was even, his name? Uh, what was that? You know, Durant. Durant. Yes, it's an interesting guy, but yeah, this is, I usually don't care about the economics of railroad stuff. That story I, can, I found kind of funny. But yeah, that was a great change. This is incredible. Matter of fact, there was such a change, they had, they had parades across the country when they had the last spike. There were parades in every town. And they had news stories all along. By you being a reporter, it's very easy historical event to report on because every newspaper had a correspondent reporting on it. And yeah, the Golden Spike was a little before my time. Oh, but, uh, but I meant historical, the documents on the, on the event are very easy because every newspaper has article upon article about this railroad. It's the hot news item of the, the, the mid-century there. So it's easy. As a matter of fact, there's too much material. One historian was complaining, so who's going to read all this? Uh, anyhow, the next change, uh, oh wait, um, but anyhow, this, I told you I'd sneak one in here, but if you're interested in learning more about the Transcontinental Railroad, I welcome you to come on May 4th, and I will have another illustrated presentation. In detail, I go back to the beginning invention of the steam engine, uh, which a lot of people don't know about, uh, but it has changed our nation. Uh, then I get into uh, the movement west a little bit again. Uh, people don't realize we developed this, a type of locomotive that was a standard. It's called the American Standard. It's around the world. And finally, I, build, I, I show you a little bit the actual photographs. The building of the railroad, they had photographers assigned while it was being built. 
And the last part is we're going to take a trip on it. So, hope you see on May 4th, I think I sneak one here. Commercial. <laughs> All right. And the other thing, change that came forth was the fact that this opened up lands. Uh, uh, parallel with the Transcontinental Railroad in 18, that was the same year was the passage of the Homestead Act. So the, they had two different ways. Not only did the government give him rid of their land, but they gave land to the railroads to get rid of as well. Plus, you were connected, you could get there. You know, it was, it was not expensive either. Passenger fares were relatively expensive. It was only 65 bucks to go from uh, St. Louis to San Francisco, which even in those days, not a lot of money. Uh, that was the third class, but you know, yeah, you could pack up and you know and get over there uh, um, to the west. But this certainly was a significant change, and believe you me, this this to uh, resulted in quite a change in demographics of the United States. Uh, along with this, the technol technology, we'll get into this later, of agriculture fostered that as well. Okay, and you can see some of the changes that took place. Not only was there a railroad, but they, everywhere the railroad went, they put uh, the telegraph lines. And you no longer needed the Pony Express, very colorful as it was. You know, I believe they hired only orphans, it was so yeah. dangerous. Uh, but the uh, telegraph uh, came through. A lot of people don't know about this. I have one of these at home on my wall. That was uh, the shipment of par packages. Railway Express Agency was a major, major operation. It still has existence in my lifetime. I remember <coughs> seeing the enormous trucks, they had green trucks down uh, by the rail. Each railroad has a warehouse by the People don't know this. Every railroad had a uh, warehouse. Uh, Northwestern was enormous, Pennsylvania. So they were all involved in this. So this brought significant changes because you could get store bought stuff. You know, normally before that, everything you got was made in the town you lived in. There was one guy of each product that you kind of needed. This way you could get store bought stuff, you know. Um, anyhow, it changed life significantly. Okay, I just like this because I'm on a good American, you know. Yeah, see, they even made their boxcars red, white, and blue. All right, now one of the changes, somebody even wrote me about this, be sure to include it, that has taken place over the course of this, this nation's history has been the change in agriculture. Uh, most significantly, all of you know about the yeah, it's been taken over by agri business. Who knows what we're eating these days. Uh, they have all sorts of chemical products. Uh, uh, and this GMO people, uh, the vegans in particular, really don't want to have any GMO stuff. And there's all kinds of arguments about it, whether it's harmful or not. Um, countries are banning it. Now they're advertising booze. I see you can get vodka. That, they say no GMO Organic. seeds or stuff is used. How do you make vodka out of potatoes or yeah, what? Potatoes. Yeah. Anyhow, no, no GMO. Brand. What kind no <coughs> GMO potatoes <coughs> for that for that vodka. But anyhow, um, I do like to follow this and spend time in, in rural areas, living on a farm. Uh, so I, I like to keep up on this and some of the. Yeah, some of the changes I applied, you know, this, this is really amazing. You can put a, 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 a here's this, well, I, oops. Somehow I don't see you shoveling out the butter. Uh, the butter. How many, uh, how many? <clears throat> oh, I was going to say, it's singularly amazing. I've been out, out west in some of the states like Washington. It's incredible, these wheat fields. I thought Kansas, I thought I knew wheat, until I saw what they did out there. It's just, it's just one goal. And one guy gets on a tractor in the morning at 8 o'clock and goes in a straight line, and at the end of the day, he gets off, and then the next day he might turn around and come back the other way. So then the harvesters are incredible when they come through town. Um, massive bits of machinery. 
Oh, I just wanted to throw this in there. Some of the changes, yeah, there's been significant changes. I mean, the way we get food has changed significantly here. Uh, the tractor was developed here, the John Deere, the Waterloo Boy, I like that name. Right here in Illinois, it was, it was uh, made and uh, still are. So, um, and modern milking, there's some arguments about this. My first speaker that I scheduled when I took on the job was the woman who spoke on uh, bovine growth hormones. Uh, honestly, I remember that. I said, what the heck is that? And anyhow, she was claiming they give these chemicals to cows and makes them produce enormous amounts of milk. Uh, they couldn't find anything bad or harmful. <coughs> that was the problem. Uh, I won't get into that, but anyhow, that's why you can't advertise, you shouldn't, they weren't able to advertise this milk is, is not made, the, the farmers didn't like it, obviously, because suddenly one cow was producing three or four times as much milk as it used to, so they're all were threatened with going out, out of business, so it was a big argument, but no one has ever ascertained that I can find out that the milk is in any way harmful, so they can't declare it, don't use it, because they say, well, why not? Anyhow, uh, coming up, I told you I'd sneak another one in here, but on June 15th, uh, we're going to, the Humane League is going to be here, and they're all going to tell us about um, the nasty things that I've done to cows and pigs and chickens. You know, I hope none of you had any of that for dinner tonight, but they'll be <laughs> to talk to convince you to maybe change your diet. Okay. Well, the other change, of course, certainly has been the organizing efforts attendant to agriculture. United Farm Workers, which I was involved with for about 10 years. Uh, there's other groups coming about, culinary workers. They've been running the state of Nevada these days. United Food, now it's United Food and Commercial Workers. You have to put up with like a woman like this claiming her bill because she was overcharged on her bill, her imitation cheese, you know. The yeah. People have to put up with that. Um, actually, I was advising that union not long ago. Uh, another change that came place in this country were the, were the, the, the experiments in communal, communal living, in particular right here in New Harmony, Indiana. Uh, which was an interesting, but they were savage to all its members to pursue the study of natural philosophy, which would be science, <coughs> without the embarrassments of modern capitalist life. And I like this money they had. One hour's labor. Makes sense to me. Base your money on, on the productivity um, that it, it, it's, it's worth. It makes sense. Okay. Another change that came in this country was the, the thoughts given to transcendentalism. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but they believed that the perfect state was attained by the individual in communal utopian ideals, um, and they didn't and they didn't care for industrial progress, scientific achievement, or organized religion. But I'm with these guys. No but this was very charity. common in the literature uh, of the period. It was debated and discussed. Um, I am along with them. And there, Jonathan, there's your your pal there, Farrell. He's, he's one of the ringleaders in you know, all this. You know, and you got Emerson holding him up. You know, as well. So, yeah. Well, we'll tell. I'll get rid of those guys. All right. Uh, another change that took place was in this. The biggest change was, uh, I have to say, the, the Civil War and the end of slavery, which was largely begun by this guy. He had occasion to stay in uh, Harper's Ferry, where he, he was going to have a slave insurrection. And he kind of, I think, he was responsible for starting the Civil War. At least they used it as one of the reasons why he said he's going to have all these slaves coming after us, after the owners. John Brown, who we said one guy here that attended it, I used to call John Brown kind of like a nutcase. 
He said, oh no, he's a wonderful guy. He was perfect, you know. So I said, he was crazy. They called him Aswatomy because there was an incident where he had some difficulties in the town. He was from Kansas. But that's his fort, uh, Johns Brown Fort. It actually was in Chicago here for the World's Fair. Uh, you probably heard the song <coughs> about Brown's body. But anyhow, he wanted to free the black people. And in the process, Harpers Ferry was a munitions uh, area. They made munitions there, armaments for the United States Army. So he was going to take all these weapons and give them to the slaves, and they were going to take over the United States. Yeah. All right, so that change. The next change, I thought, now we're following chronologically here. I know, I know you all caught that. Um, the next change that took place that I could ascertain in 1871 <coughs> was the extraction of natural resources for profit, which is still going on. Uh, capitalists uh, just want to take the earth and uh, make money, so they don't care. They'll chop down trees, you know, and big oil is still out there. Uh, coal, I thought we'd focus on here, has been around for a long time. It provided half the nation's energy from the 1880s to the 50s. Um, it's still present in 25 states, and 40% of it is on mine, on, when it is mined, on public lands. Now, the President of the United States claims to dig coal. Um, there's not much use for it right now, obviously, because natural gas, wind, and solar as we're, we're going to learn next week, are putting it out of business as well as the nukes. Actually, I heard a lecture last week on, on C-SPAN. I saw that, and the coal boys were on there, coal men. And they were claiming, oh, coal is wonderful because it's stored energy. <laughs> and if there's an emergency, or, or uh, what do you call it, brownout or, you know, the wind is going to stop, and the wind ain't going to blow, and the sun ain't going to shine, and you can store coal and use it when you need it. Unlike the <laughs> other, one, other guys, so don't listen to them, listen to us, and go pro coal. Okay? Uh, just to show you what's going on here, uh, the railroads there, the Union Pacific that went out west, is making a lot of money, and their primary business was shipping coal from the Powder, Powder River Basin of Wyoming, which is the largest house of coal in the world. Uh, part of they were building the track in a contest to see who would get the, they knew that coal was out there. There was a contest to get it, but this is from the, the rail yard in Nebraska to give you an indication of the amount, and this is every day. This is going on, not right now necessarily, but when they're, they have four line main, uh, strictly for the purpose of shipping coal. This is a lot of stuff. Another thing that change, uh, the, the capitalists have brought us are uh, infernos by shipping crude oil, which I've spoken on here at the college, and we can thank the capitalists for that, that you, you, you may get burned up to the crisp you know, in no time. Believe you me, these are really, really nasty fires. All right, another thing regarding energy. Uh, there's still, I just thought I'd throw this in here. Uh, there's nuke juice trains. This is the hot topic now. The nuke juice, nuke juice trains. Maybe we'll discuss this next week. But some people think it's okay to have the 40,000 tank car train full of radioactive liquid, you know, they have a bunch of them, you know. They, they, they make, they're really good when they go in the rivers, you know. They, you know, make good for good drinking water. Okay, uh, another change that's been going on in continuing this line of thought that began in the previous seminar is uh, environmental degradation. One of the things I think that made the United States a successful nation wasn't so much that we did things better than other people did, but when it came to the ingredients for making things, there's no place on earth like the United States, a continental country, for uh, uh, having 
resources in a pure form and in incredible abundance. Whether it be iron ore, bauxite, potash, things like that, there's no place you can find it. All, all you want and in really good form. So that's what I mean. But this is what we've ended up with. You know, they take a pretty little park land like that, and you know, you end up with this gray stuff. And they disappear. Another incident, I'm, I'm moving ahead a little bit in chronologically, but it, an incident that brought change in the United States <coughs> was um, the Three Mile Island. Having been a resident of Pennsylvania, not terribly far from there, I can tell you this has brought some change in our way of thinking about nuclear energy. When we're all going to die, uh, it was rated five on a scale of seven. This was a no fool and accident. Uh, and one million gallons at, the, at temperatures of 5,000 degrees and the guys try to minimize this. Oh, don't worry about it. that. Was no big deal, you know. And you got nothing to worry about. But it brought, fortunately, a change in our way of thinking. Okay, getting back, and I got to get back in time. Remember, we left in 1871. In 1886, the eight-hour day, the Haymarket Square. You are all familiar with this, I would presume. It was a bomb thrower. I had. <laughs> <laughs> they had a movie version they made recently in Chicago, and I won the part of the Bob Thrower. <laughs> but on April 27th, we always have a May Day speaker to commemorate. We used to read a play. We got tired of doing that. And anyhow, the the um, industrial workers of the world will be here on April 27th. So that's your next commercial. Okay, moving on from the 1890s. Though, now this was a real movement for change and the term is now being used again. I never thought it would happen. But in the early 1890s, sorry, the term of the century was called the progressive movement. And I currently subscribe to a dozen uh, Facebook pages which use the term progressive. It is a popular political concept, whether you like it or not. It's in the minds of the people. It's in the titles of their organizations. Illinois Progressive Party, a guy was trying to establish, things like that. But the progressive movement, it's a fascinating period. The reformers, if you like. They were the reformers of the period, much needed, like Butler, they were largely reporters in the major, uh, people, the catalyst behind it, the muckrackers, were people in journalism. Now, the people don't pay attention to journalists today, but yes, they do have a very important purpose to serve uh, in that regard. Uh, one of the reasons you need a progressive movement is that some people like to think that capitalism is so wonderful, but I came across this figure the other day but if you work on Wall Street, your average bonus is $150,000. This is a bonus, this is above your salary. You know, for sitting around and saying, let's go, oh, I'm an investor, I'm an investor. Yeah. Yeah. Makes no contribution to this nation, anyhow. Um, all right, moving on. We left the turn of the century now, 1905, right here in <coughs> Chicago was the founding of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, held their convention right here in Chicago, attended by Big Bill Haywood, uh, Mother Jones. Uh, you can tell, you see, uh, the code was, if you were a real wobbly and not a company spy, you would be able to tell me which eye Big Bill Haywood was missing an eye or a patch. Was it on the right or the left side? If you, if you didn't answer correctly, you, chances are you were a spy. So you know. He, he had his only photograph, one facing one way. All the photographs of him are facing one way because he didn't, he didn't want to show that eye patch. But uh, they were one of the three major groups. You had the IWW, the AFL, and the CIO. 
So it's an interesting thing. They'll be here June 27th. All right, moving on. We left the early century there. In 1917, uh, with the founding of the organization which I have been affiliated with for more than a quarter century, the National Federation of Federal Employees, working for you where you work. Wow. <laughs> and we work for America every day. Anyhow, uh, there was the founding of it, and you might say, oh, well, so what, what was that all? What's the big deal about that? Is that it, it was the beginning of the deep state surveillance and take over the United States? I'll tell you what it meant. And we're still at it today. Uh, you know, as our logo goes, in God we trust, all others we monitor. <laughs> I love it. You got nothing to be afraid of if you behave yourself. Just behave yourself. You know, and of course, oligarchy has replaced constitutional government. We've had several programs on this. Uh, you were, some people are mistakenly believing that there's constitutional, oh, the constitution, uh, but that's it. Um, and um, let's see what else. All right, uh, following on, 1923, you don't have to get into this, the War Resistance League, which I've been affiliated with as well. <coughs> I'm chairman of the Chicago chapter, but we're having uh, the War Resistance League. It's been instrumental, you can see over the years, in the uh, peace movement, trying to bring an end to war change in that regard. Uh, here's another commercial coming at you, but Gene already announced it. We're going to have a demonstration, as we have for many, many years on April 15th, outside the post office, so to, trying to dis discourage people from paying any war tax. So hope to see you on the 15th. Uh, you know. Just don't pay it. Tell me I don't feel like it. Anyhow, uh, moving on from uh, uh, we, the, the next event that um, is, was the Scopes Tennessee Evolution Trial. I need to go into detail of this. Uh, they're still being uh, the creationists. They're still arguing this or attempting to. Uh, creation science is still out there. So I don't know, uh, but the discussion was trying to change our attitudes towards us. Before that, it was pretty unilateral. Following that, after that, since we're talking about religion, um, the uh, uh, Hubble constant, which is uh, an important number, the most important numeric regarding the planets, was discovered by Mr. Hubble in 1929, and the search has continued on ever since. So the pursuit of scientific truth uh, has been going on. Hubble's constant is, is the rate that the planets move uh, through the sky. Okay. Uh, now, to continue the thing on, on science, if you want to discuss scientific truth on April 13th, Ellen Corley will be here. She says she's a research scholar. I'm a scholar. She's fairly knowledgeable, but she's going to be talking uh, on this question. You know, Mr. Trump says I'm not a not a big believer. Not a big, you know. Uh, but anyhow, Ellen, if you want to read this, she says her main point is there's a war on scientific truth by the powers that be. The state <coughs> in denying climate change is a real threat. Nuclear proliferation is a real threat. And suspending the rights of the people. Oh, the, these are just the people. By <laughs> the surveillance thing. Hey, come on. Who writes this stuff? <laughs> oh, we're going to get you. you <laughs> Hey, you better change your house home. <laughs> Anyhow, she says, in other words, she has, this is a good discussion, though, and she's defending science in the broad sense of the word, meaning that we are all scientists seeking truth, 
and I'll make others find truth. See, I help you guys find truth. Oh yeah. Yeah, I do. I try. I try. I don't know why I should have given up long ago. I don't know either, Charlie. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but loss of truth. I love this. I put this on the Facebook. The loss of truth is a real threat to our democracy and our survival on the planet. But the deep state's going to get you. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's all. Anyhow, we have to see you next week. It should be an, inter an interesting discussion. Moving on, we left, we left uh, 29, uh, 35, National Labor Relations Act, which recognized people who realized this, unions before this were criminal conspiracies against the law. This made collective bargaining where, where companies, upon the decision of the people who work there, they have to recognize them as uh, the representative of the employees. After elections in, in companies I used to in places, agencies, they would send me to be the first guy after the union won the election. And believe you me, employers refused to recognize me. They would. They had the police at the gate, anything. They say, I don't recognize you. What are you doing here? And I said, oh, you have to recognize me. I'm representing the employees. And then I come back, you know, one guy, I should tell this story. I, one guy said, I told him, I said, I'm representing the employees who so were recognized as representing the people who work in this place. And he said, who the fuck are you? So the next day I went back and I brought the regional director of the Federal Labor Relations Authority over to that office. And I introduced him to this business guy. And I said, Do you kindly tell this gentleman who the fuck I am? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, following this up is a really, really important piece of legislation the Fair Labor Standards Act. You can read the criteria for the hour a week. Minimum wage, time and a half for overtime, which they're trying. Trump's trying to get into that, believe you me. They're trying to piece these apart. Um, and child labor, um, amended with the Bay Act of 63. But uh, it's a good piece of thing. That there's no wage slavery. Following it up, okay, we left the 30s. Now in the 40s, this institution of one world government by the United Nations. This pin right here in the center of my head is a pin from the United Nations Association of Chicago, which I highly recommend all of you to join and attend their periodic events. Anyhow. Where is that American flag? Pardon me? Where is that American flag? Well, those are flags of various nations. They're not American. Those are, those are the European Union, government. actually. That, those particular flags. Thank you. Uh, that's no, European no, Union right flags. There. All right, following up. We're in the 40s there, but uh, <coughs> this actually kind of began earlier in the century, but it took hold uh, after the war, and particularly in the 50s, was uh, the capitalists were afraid of communism. They saw what took place overseas. They were taking steps to restrict. They came up with various things <laughs> uh, to apprehend uh, anyone who was of socialist or communist persuasion. My union still has a clause, if you find it someplace, that no one can be a member who is a communist. So they put that in there because the, and McCarthyism was there. So we talk about change, there were changes. The next major change was the fact that in 47, the United States government had possession of a vehicle from outer space, which they didn't want to tell us. So it ins yeah, right. instituted certainly a change of inquiry, our, our change in our attitudes towards our uniqueness in the universe. But this this is again, this government's been going on for many, many years. These, these government guys are good at it. So don't think they're gonna crack after all these years. All right. Uh, just one other guy you brought about change of all the people in, in like social, especially among the black people, I think the one guy that did more to bring about change for the black people of this nation was A. Philip Randolph. He was uh, 
chairman of the uh, founder of the Pullman Porters in the 30s, which if they caught him, they would have killed him. And he persisted in this. He actually organized the movement. Uh, he did things like get the, the blacks in the military under Truman. And he actually was the guy behind that 63 activity. He was getting old at that time. But uh, the only statue I know of him is in a railroad station in Washington. All right, moving on from there uh, to the 60s. Now we left the 50s. We're in the 60s, the war on poverty to affect the, the, we had to have a war on poverty because capitalism wasn't doing any good to these people. <laughs> they were living in abject poverty. I, my first job was in the war on poverty, uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity in Appalachia. Okay, moving on from the uh, 60s, uh, the next year, the pr progressive legislation was Medicare and Medicaid, which uh, some guy running for president thinks should be expanded to cover all the people in the United States. Yeah. Get around in the 60s, there's another government cover up. Oh, I a big foot was filmed. Yeah. Uh, we even had a speaker on this. I've been thinking of talking about this myself. Um, but uh, this, uh, what do you call it, cryptozoology. Uh, we used to have a guy who spoke about it, but in 1967, the search for a big book to ascertain uh, the species living in the continental United States began, which didn't exist before. Um, also in the 60s, sort of the change was the, the end of war by people through peaceful process, not always peaceful, but a change that they uh, that you could protest. Yeah. I don't think anybody really protested in any magnitude until this time. But I don't know. And then further in the 60s, uh, we may have a program on this. In 69 was the moon landing. Changed our perspective of the world. Or at least the government wanted us to think differently about the universe and the moon. Okay, and shortly after that, uh, one of the, the green eco stuff started. And the first Earth Day was celebrated in 1970. Uh, not much happened at that time. Um, you know, actually, I will brag on this. For uh, three years, I ran the Earth Day celebration downtown Chicago. Yeah, I had tables and tents and all that kind of good stuff. So had like 40 exhibitors and stuff like that. And EPA uh, sponsored me. It, you know, it wasn't part of my job. That was the amazing thing. I just kind of like left work and did it. <laughs> but we held it in the federal federal plaza. You can see even model railroaders have gotten up. This is a model railroad outfit with wind power. And coming up April 20th, Special Earth Day debate, which we heard about earlier. Tim Boulder of the Thorium Boys and Dennis Nelson and an anti nuke. Tim. are going to nuke it out. So the sea wins, yeah. you know. Following up in the 90s, uh, we jump in the 90s, NAFTA, the free trade agreement. You can see what happens. Uh, globalization really kicked in, you know, a lot of good jobs for the young ladies in Asia, good sweatshop jobs, you know. But the response to it, of course, was in 211, the Occupy Wall Street activities. And then cities across the country, 951 cities, 82 countries, and 600 communities in the United States came out against capitalism. So we can see the, the progressives here. Uh, but here's a guy carrying a sign, capitalism is not working. <laughs> that's, that's all you need to say, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, this went on wrong. further. Uh, this is actually a lineage now. The Occupy movement was looking for a candidate uh, for the to run as president of the United States, and Bernie Sanders' name was advanced as the candidate they chose and asked to become the candidate. 
So in fact, you're talking about the candidate of the Occupy Movement. Yes, that's absolutely true. There you see me, persuading students at the University of Illinois, get those young minds to talk to the kids, you know. They say, hey, you know, this guy sounds all right, you know. You know, there's just some other little things getting around town, I thought I'd throw them in. Huh. There we go. Yeah. All right, and I told you I'd throw another thing, and this is my announcement. If you uh, like socialism and progressive stuff, next Saturday uh, is the Chicago Conference of the Chicago Socialist Party. The Socialist Party of USA. <coughs> So you can be there. We're going to be at the Bucktown Library all day. Now the last change, we're almost done. Only two changes left. Thank you for persevering. Is the Green New Deal. So, uh, and the degrowth one's best. <laughs> this is from my... Quackery at its best, Charlie. The Green New Deal. I gave a presentation oh. on that. And if you want to learn more, you can come on June 29th. <coughs> and Lizzie Anderson will be talking about what is the Green New Deal, yeah, who, benefits by, who benefits from it, we all benefit from it. All the people of the earth. Mm -hmm. And then how to pay for it, make the capitalists, make the petroleum. I put a thing out, make the petroleum companies pay for it all. But also following that up, on July 6th is, is the first time uh, we are run into, but he's going to talk about climate justice. Okay, and the last change I have <laughs> is that um, 2020, this is my prediction, Trump will be arrested and his cohorts and God willing. Trump Jr. and they're going to put him in jail. Anyhow, thank you very much. <laughs> Too bad. Well, there's a lot of change in the United States. So let's hear from you folks. Okay. Do, do we want to forego questioning and get right into uh, rebuttals? Yeah, you don't need it. Do you have any questions? Or over? Nah. Oh, I got one question. What, what part of the tax uh, is the war, is what you refer to as the war tax? Can you educate me? Uh, I hate to refer you to another page, but the War tax resistance group indicates on, the, on their website um, uh, various ways of achieving. There's multiple ways that if that talk to the microphone, Charlie. But you can I can't hear you. What microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. She's asking, how do you re, how do you not pay war tax? No, that wasn't my question. Oh, my question was. What is what is part of the tax are you saying you're resisting? What is, does the war tax oh, consist of? The, the, right in the back is the pie chart. Every year okay. is a pie chart with the federal budget. Okay. And this is last year's chart. I just got a shipment. I didn't open the box. It's pretty much the same as I said. But the pie chart is the famous thing that we all hand out across the country, the war resistors and other peace groups, and it indicates the federal budget. Basically, it's been around one-third of the federal budget, creeping up to a half or so. The federal budget, I might as well can answer this question, about one-third military, 50% is uh, disbursement. What do you call it? Uh, Social Security entitlements. And um, less than 10% is the actual federal government that we think of. Federal government is, is relatively inexpensive. And um, the other portion of it is payment on the national debt. And uh, that's what I mean. The, the payment, the federal government is like le always less than 10%. You say, oh, cut government, cut government, you know when it's the military and the entitlements uh, and the interests that account for over 90% of the federal budget. Okay. All right, Charlie. I well, got we it. got two or three. Okay. okay. Got, what kind of chair are you facing the crowd? Well, All I right. Have, yes, I have, lady. You know, 
Shiba. Well, not so young, but um, I want to thank you for your comprehensive, you know, his historical perspective. But there's one thing that is really missing in your presentation, and I think of the Abigail, you know, Adams admonishment to her husband. Don't forget the ladies. Yes. Uh, wait a minute. I got that answer all prepared. Nineteenth Amendment. I not. I didn't. I didn't leave. The, I left it out because you didn't succeed in the amendment, and I didn't think without that uh, the women's movement didn't. You know, you could leave it. This is. Oh, there's no rules right. on this. But honestly, I didn't know. I didn't think about it. But I said the fact that they were unsuccessful in getting the amendment through. Doesn't mean the movement hasn't made progress, but uh, I don't even know how did the Fair Pay Act go. Is that still that hasn't? That's what I mean. But I think yeah. some of it had some profound um, societal effects. You know, um, you, you you had the uh, sentiments. You know, I'm, you know, of women's rights back back in the back in the. 18, you know, 80s, you know, and really the expression of the thought that women should be part of the Constitution. The only right. Point number two, we got the vote, you know, right to vote. Are you saying that that hasn't had a profound effect on our politics? No, I don't think it has because we don't, we don't know how women voted different than men. Yes, but I'll uh, tell you this much, well, they we're getting back to your first one. The only <laughs> rights we have are those established by law. Now come on, either get the law passed, or don't don't believe, don't tell me it's successful. Mm -hmm. I know this. I work Congress. Either you get it or you don't. So don't get rec I'm not gonna recognize people who haven't done their stuff yet. It's not your fault. They were up in a lot of opposition. Yeah, but they haven't got that, the law. If you haven't got to see but they changed the color. I showed you labor law, right? Yeah. Good. We get it passed. You know. Well, so good luck. I'm there. not for it. We're getting there. Illinois passed. But until you right. get that's why I purposely left it off. I said there's no legislation. Rebuttal. See, yeah. Charlie, that's my my I would say also kind of a uh, question comment, but um a large amount of our well, yes, it will. Oh, um, as much as it can. Women have voted the same as men, so it has to change. Here's the thing. Actually, the women's voters. rights has to make some progress at the state level. Why do you and have to pay taxes? But recently, I think it's almost there. But they, the point that I think you, well, you're not, not really emphasizing. Are you ready or no? It's that I'll bring yes. up next week is the, the, the tension between you know, the, the repression of the state on the women, on the cows, on the on the truth. You know, the there's always this and when you you know, you talk about surveillance and uh, you know, like oh big deal surveillance. It it is it's not constitutional and you, you can't get your state to be constitutional. What can you do? You know, so these are well, these are problems. You know, this is listen, change is you know You've got to do it within the framework of the structure. And it's, well, if you haven't done it, it's not, don't blame the system. I mean, believe you me, I know it's impossible to pass laws, but I have done it. I've actually passed one single law myself, and entirely myself, by trickery and, and thought and actions. And you can do it. It's often not easy, not all no to no actions are the same. But you know, that's ridiculous. the way the name of the game is played, you know. But certainly when it comes to what you're attempting to achieve an enforcement. Now the blacks did it too, I didn't let them out, but the Civil Service Reform Act, I tell you, the Equal Employment Act, they really had their act together to show you how much they succeeded. Not only did they enforce a law that found that discrimination unlawful, they, this is the best part of it. There's a penalty if you are found guilty of discrimination. They really got the full nine yards on that one. And that's what makes that law effective. It's not just, oh, don't do it again. Oh, well, please don't do it again, la di da you can get penalized up front. It's, I think, $130,000.
Thank you. 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 Thank it's the way the law is applied selectively and by the your Justice Department prosecutors, you know, they're like, we're not going to apply the law of murder to Jason Van Dyke. You know, they, this, okay. this is the kind of collusion and state abuse of power that worries me. And, and I, you know, I wish it worried you more, you know, as someone who's with the state. And, like, federal workers can't strike. I met a federal worker said, I'd love to be an activist, but I can't because I work Thank for the federal know. government. But yet the police are standing there protesting this, you know, Kim Fox It makes, makes no sense to strike if they can replace you. Well, no, why did the police get to I don't, come I don't, up, you know, I, protest in the streets okay. about it? I don't, I don't believe, I think anybody who wants to strike is, you're well, taking a, a chance you can lose. It doesn't seem you like You don't win every strike. All right. <laughs> hey, some unions represent management and not somebody really doesn't know, right, doesn't right. know what they're doing. I'm sorry. Uh, it's hard to get group rights when you think are the oppressed. right to strike is the only. Let me tell you, I, get, I, I would never trade the right to strike for third party arbitration. That's third party decision making. I do this. I get we get a neutral third party instead of strikes. Blah, 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 yeah, yeah. I go before a gentleman who knows labor law. They have background in the of law judges. And I present my situation, my arguments. And the other side presents theirs. <coughs> and can. then we do it in a very orderly fashion. And at the end of the day, he says, Mr. Paydock, you win. Mr. Paydock, you lose. That's the way you know, we deal with arbitration. So we deal with arbitrations and mediator, mediation. OK. You know, we have things called mediation service. And take advantage of that and use your skills. Uh, Believe you me, the other route is, I don't see what the advantage of that is. I got a 50-50 chance up front with a mediator. As a matter of fact, I can come away with something in negotiations usually. In a strike, not only, you don't even get that, but you might not even have jobs. Don't you think that the history of the United States... Okay, let's move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Abusing so the rights of the United We can, let's not debate yeah. it. Uh, Terry, I'd like to ask you a question. What major event happened on November 3rd, 2016? You should know this one. It was November 6th, 2016. We wept someone. Was yeah. No! The Chicago Cubs won the World Series. Oh, come on. That was an event of great significance. After a 108 year deficit, the city celebrated a lot more than All right, folks, let's hear your ideas. Jonathan's their got chain. a question. Jonathan has one. Oh, all right. Yeah, 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 all right. So, all right. So, so on your water. <laughs> Well, the discovery of the, the confirmation of the species. Confirmation? You know, confirmation. <laughs> what confirmation? The Bigfoot. Photographic evidence is like yeah. confirmation? You got something better than a picture? Picture for the I got lots of pictures. You saw it. You want to see it again? You ever date a Cuban? Looks just like him. Oh. Hey, you saw that. <laughs> what? He's some guy in a suit. <laughs> what? Dating Cuban. It's a new side. Listen, they analyzed it and they say no. That's not how a guy would walk. I sat through those. And they were gone frame by frame. And the guy in, in, in us, humans don't run like that, that guy that the, the gate, the boom, 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 boom. that's all been analyzed, all been looked at very carefully by ape specialists, private Scientific specialists. minds ever. Yes. And you can, that's, yeah, that, it's like here, we, we move our ad, whereas apes, I know the state, they move their own shoulders like that. Unilaterally. And they, that's been all looked at. All right, Andy. I got a question. 
uh, was the discovery of Bigfoot the only other uh, different civilization other than humans on the planet that's been, uh, you know, uh, you have in the it range of change? Uh, I think you missed a great couple of great moments in history when it was confirmed that there were other civilizations here working with us, visiting us. You mean the Greys? Roswell. Science in the Bible. Science. I, I do folk tales, so I don't, that's just folk tales. I think you see funny. I, I like ancient aliens, but I'm not going to use folk tales as, as evidence of anything. Those are, those are just stories, guys. They didn't have TV, so they'd sit around the campfire and tell stories. And then they wrote this down. Do you think that's factual? That's, that's, that's not, those are folk tales. The Bible folk tales are poetry, man. I mean, and I love it. I I always get to the British man. I deal in archaeology. I always get biblical archaeology, and they actually try to verify you what's said or located in the Bible. Oil. That's that's a that's a fruitless endeavor. I mean, they didn't write with any degree of accuracy. They didn't even know what history was. All right, three bottles. No, they didn't. Three bottles. No, they're out. Of, they didn't even know how to write it. We gotta break this bloviator. What else? Break this bloviator. Break the bloviator. Come on. My question is, and I wrote it down. Was John Brown indeed insane? Or was he so overtaken by genuine Save religious fervor that, that he honestly believed that the masses of Americans would respond to his and others' raid on Harper's Ferry and come to his aid to abolish slavery? I I like the guy. I think he was completely nuts, though. He, he, that's crazy. Yeah. Even Osama bin Laden. I don't think he thought they'd take over the state. He, 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 he was taking over yeah. an armory. Yeah. And then he wanted these he pipes. He wanted to arm them with pipes. And this, there were 18 of them. Did he have a plan for them to take over the country? All right, let's he move on to rebuttals. Rebuttals. They were going to take themselves in. Rebuttals, not bloviation. Rebuttals, not bloviation. Rebuttals, not bloviation. Rebuttals, not bloviation. All right, I'm not going get anybody. Rebuttals, uh, not bloviation. I'll go first. You go first. We'll have, uh, we'll give you four minutes each, but I'm not going to do the full four minutes. Charlie is missing one of the most fundamental events that really changed the country. He had mentioned one, which was the dividing of the Golden Spike, but he forgot another one which has made more of an impact on all of our daily lives in many ways and that was in uh let me see if i can pull it up here it was june 29th 1956 and it was the passage of the interstate highway act by eisenhower the development of a coast-to-coast -coast highway that would provide speedy travel in and outside of cities and through cities. It's had its uh, good and evil parts. It's had its things, but I can think of nothing that has made such a daily change. The next big event that most of you don't realize is um, June, I said it's November, I think it was November 11th, 1989. That was the day when the windows went up and the walls came tumbling down. Oh, yeah. The, the uh, Windows 3.1 was introduced by Microsoft and the Berlin Wall fell. Of course, we all know about December 7th and September 11th. But those are just a few of the missing key characteristics that Charlie here <coughs> forgot. And of course, his claim that capitalism hasn't succeeded, it's dead wrong. As of right now, there are more people coming out of poverty around the world. There are more people being literate around the world. We're seeing significant progress in the, in the, in the human, in the, uh, normalization of human development and personally I attribute it 
to the expansion of world <coughs> trade and world uh, and globalization. Can I get the right? Oh boy, Tim! <laughs> You're dead wrong, Charlie. Let's just face it. So, uh, Charles, thanks a uh, lot for your presentation. Uh, there's a book by James Cohen, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, and he does dis he is a, psych uh, a sociologist rather than a psychologist, but he does say that John Brown was not insane. So uh, there is an argument <laughs> that's there. That's, uh, uh, also, uh, the question that you'll probably want to answer in one of your later presentations, maybe I got this wrong, but I think they started the Intercontinental Railroad in the Civil War. No, 1869, Charlie's right about that. It yeah. started or it finished? finished? It finished. It was finished and the spike well, was laid down. When did it start? Oh, it was actually yeah, during the Civil War. It was simple. passed, but probably just on the end, really, towards the end of the war. <laughs> well, to answer your question, it passed as a law. They were doing bureaucratic stuff. They couldn't get supplies to do it because of the war. Okay. But you, needed, you needed black powder, you needed iron, steel, they, so you could, yeah, on paper they had it, but the actual, let's say, really doing anything? The main bureaucratic hold up was, the decision, the, the, made, was those, the decision of the route. Your, the price of, of iron was like five times, you know. Okay, I think my time is up. I, I should have they did, they that had 62. Thank you. It was gas, but I think we're only. Certain dates that Charlie also left out were first the landing at Jamestown, which was 1607 and which was much earlier than, than the landing of the colonists at Plymouth. Second, 1619. That's when the first slaves came to the United States, with all the trouble that that brought. Third, 1787, the adoption of the Constitution. Yep. I don't think anybody else has come up with a better form of government than, than the Constitution and all its flaws provides. Fourth, I would say the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln as president, and the start of the Civil War, which was an enormously transformational event in the history of this country. It decided once and for all the issue of states' rights, and it, it helped destroy slavery. And President Lincoln was a symbol of what, one per, of, of the American, of what historically has been the American dream. How one person can you can work at their own and <coughs> their own labors, transform themselves, come out of poverty to accomplish great things. And next, I would say he also left out the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt. Yep. He touched on it some, the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt and the whole transformational process of the New Deal. How that got the federal government involved in the life and making it the betterment of individual citizens. I'm not a believer in little government. I think that sucks. I'm a believer in big government so that it can come out and help people with their problems and also the transformational effect that World War II had on this country. Suddenly we came from a little nation that just hid from the world and was, and was something that took part in world affairs. I don't say that we should ram ourselves into every country's problems, but I do say that it's, we also should not just sit and do nothing. That's how Hitler went out on his rampage, thanks in part to that. And I was glad to see that other people brought up the subject of, of, of uh, the, inter the development of the interstate highway system, both good and bad, and that Charlie touched on the moon landing, which was also a transformational event, Ted Aranda be damned. And, well, I guess that's pretty much about it. Thank you. Thank you. What have I got this far? They stole my water. They did it again. Okay. I would like to agree 
you know, with, with the previous comments, you know, every period has been a redefinition of the rights that have been initially enunciated in the U.S. You know, on the U.S. You know, Constitution, whether it be women's rights, whether it be, you know, the right to vote for African Americans, gay and lesbian rights, they, uh, they all have a place in, in the social and the political process of the, this country. Um, I wouldn't so downplay, you know, the, uh, the women's movement. You know, uh, any movement is a marathon, not a sprint. It took 70 years for women to get the right to vote. It took, it took an asshole like Trump to get women up and going in the Women's March, the political impact of that on the elections last year. This is a marathon, not a sprint. I think that's something to be kept in mind. Secondly, you can't rule out the role of technology in all of this. The invention of labor saving, you know, products like the vacuum cleaner, like like uh, the like the um, washer and dryer, like the dishwasher. All all these all these developments made housekeeping, you know, less physically demanding and freed women to go out of the home and prepare for different careers that were never available, you know, before. The development of birth control, which gave women the right to uh, decide when they can have children. What could be more personal than that? So yes, the women's movement has had its defeats lately. And, and for very traditional women, they have seen that as a threat. It is their success that has really scared the living daylights out of, out of those women because it, it, it attempted to break the status quo. And that's why you're getting the, this resistance right now. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Ellen Corley, and I love this free speech forum uh, for, you know, exactly the reason of hearing what you just said, that um, to me, what it's given me a chance to understand if, how important free speech is, and that First Amendment is, you know, that you can just, you think of an amendment, what does that mean, or uh, a right, what is that? To me, you don't understand them until you don't have them, right? Until you you experience somebody, you know, try working for five dollars an hour. You know, I grew up wealthy family, and nothing really made sense. And then I get cut off for no good reason. But I got you know working for actually I married a guy they didn't like. You know, he seemed socialist, and so I you know get cut off. They didn't want to get taken. Working, you know, trying to live on 13000 a year as a teacher, uh, you know, with a, it's hard to do. I, but yet I didn't understand unions, I, you know, because I was so brainwashed. I ran, you know, producers. I just wanted to succeed in the capitalist way, you know. Um, I, I'll be a producer, and I don't want to be a parasite. But what you realize is, you, you look at the Ayn Rand movie, how did she, you know, that she just was born into being a train. You know, her father had the train, so she believes in trains, right? The, you know, history of the elitist, this capitalism is written for that. And until I, I and I, that's how I know that they're waging a war on labor, on demand. If they're like all supply side, all bankers, we'll take the money and, you know, how much of it trickles down? It was a big lie. 
Just like Hitler said winning the war was easy once he had the media and the big lies. And those big lies, the big lies you realize are in the United States media. We, it's the year 1913 it occurred to me, the progressive era ended the same time the PR industry started. That's why the Creel Commission and the, you know, the government comes up with people, Americans don't want to go fight a war that has nothing to do with them. You know, as Smedley Butler later said, you know, he was a Marine officer who fought these wars. He said, war is a racket. I fought all, you know, in 1933, he realized it after the fact. He'd gone and waged war in Cuba and everywhere. And he realized it was for them to get rich. The same J.P. Morgan and Rothschild and, that took over our Federal Reserve in 1913 when we weren't looking and then made it classified. To, so to this day, we don't have ever audit our Federal Reserve system and the fact that the whole thing is built on they take a do, you know a dollar or ten percent of every loan that they're extending to us, and so they're keeping us in debt, you know. And so you've got to work harder, and you've got to borrow money, and then you have to pay them. And we never we're slaves all to this system, and yet the propaganda that they came up with in 1913. Um, this is Ivy and, and the founders of the public relations and marketing and advertising. It, I used to work in it, and it, it's all to make spin them looking good, you know, make war look good, make smoking look good, make, you know, that, you know, sell bare aspirin. All of the clients at the ad agency I worked in, I realized were like Bayer and, and BP. Turns out these are all the same Rockefeller, Rothschild, J.P. Morgan companies. So really, all this corporate, you know, Alcoa, there. This has never been a free market, you know. And right, I'm, a Tim walks out when I talk about this because this is the point of free speech. You've got to hear what's hard to hear. You've got to hear what you don't want to hear. That's what the problem with my stepfather was. That's the problem with. You know, if Tim, if you're just a Republican and you can't, and you just like, why are those women protesting? Why are those crazy liberals protesting? Why are those, and they don't listen. If we, we have got to listen to each other, right? There's got to be this, you listen, and then you come to an understanding. Right now, they deliberately, the PR money from our own companies, go in there and wedge us, divide and conquer. This was Hitler's lawyer, Carl Schmidt, came up with the divide and conquer strategy of tension method of let's go in and use terrorism to divide and make the managers and the labor at war from each other. Make the Democrats and the Republicans at war with each other. So actually right now most Republicans believe that you know, that, that welfare, you know, people are lazy and blacks are lazy and unions are lazy and, and all these, you know, and so they're never going to respect each other. I agree, I found out doing my colonial days that my ancestors came over to Jamestown in the 1640s. This was a group, the second child of these families. They couldn't, they didn't inherit the money, so they got to come over here and be, it's a kind of big idea, come over to America and start a church. Or, but, so they were governors and attorney generals. This is where Robert E. Lee and George Washington are, are actually the more interesting ones is they were, Richard Henry Lee was my ancestor that was Washington's friend and he said, Never was there such a good group of people brought together as we have here in the Declaration of Independence. He orchestrated against slavery. He, he talked them into coming together from the 13 colonies. You know, he, when they, you know, the Southerners are this and the Boston guys are that, you know, it's like let's really, you know, College of Complex, not just I talk and then you ask a question and then you rebut. But let's try to come together, right, and um, and solve these problems. And that's what worries me is 
atomism and that, that we're all divided scientifically. It's very convenient for the rich and I'll tell you more next week. Okay. I didn't think you'd go 10 minutes. Once I agree with some crap part. <clears throat> Um, one thing left out of the uh, the presentation was uh, anything on uh, aviation. Uh, it's uh, really made this world a smaller place. We uh, invented. Um, we are the first people to fly an airplane. Uh, there was actually a guy named Goddard who was doing a. Uh, studies on rockets back in the 20s. Uh, so far ahead of his time, people just thought he was like a crazy whack job. And he was just brilliant seeing ahead, seeing the future. The Germans read his research. The Germans read his research, yeah, that would make sense. Um, and uh, we had a guy who was the first person to fly across the Atlantic. Came the one of the most famous people per, people in the world because of it. And also we're able to uh, send a guy to the moon. Pretty amazing stuff. So uh, of course a lot of that technology was courtesy of some Germans, but uh, we implemented it. So uh, yeah, something on aviation I think would have been fitting to put into that presentation. Um, I, uh, I actually would um, refute the idea that uh, John Brown really had any kind of uh, influence on history. I, uh, there's so many people who have a legitimate claim to helping the cause of uh, uh, African Americans. Uh, Frederick Douglass or W.B. Du Bois. Um, John Brown was a whack job. He's a fanatic. He was. He was uh, he was, um, he, he basically was a guy who was way too religious to be practical, and he literally, in Kansas, he did a horrible, he was a terrorist. He literally was a terrorist, he was going into homes and killing people. Um, so, I mean, he, he believed in a cause, but, um, but the means to the end were absolutely horrid, he was a horrible person. And then finally, uh, I wanted to, uh, make a comment about what something uh, Tim said, and he says it constantly, about how capitalism is a uh, wunderbar. So many people are coming out of poverty. You know how easy it is to get people out of poverty in third world countries? You send them in, send a corporation in, so they own everything, and then pay them five bucks an hour, and suddenly they've got money in their pocket, and they're like floating, floating on air. Wow, I can feed my kids. I'm loaded now. What a bunch of hooey. And what Tim fails to admit is that if you look at poverty in this country, guess what capitalism is doing for this country? We're pushing people into poverty. We're, we're shrinking the middle class. We're making, we're making it hard, easier for people to be poor, easier for, for corporations to pull the money out of, of the pockets of hardworking Americans who are just trying to pay their bills pay their medicine, pay their heat, buy food. Uh, there's some, there, I, there was a, the Washington Post had an article about a month ago that said um, uh, there was a very bad economic indicator that there's a large percentage of Americans, about 20% are two months behind on their car payment. So this, this is echoes of 2008 when people weren't paying their mortgages because they didn't have the money and now you've got people where if they can't pay their car payment, guess what happens? Repossession and they can't drive to work. God bless capitalism. Thanks. Well, Alan's a good John Brown guy. John Brown guy. How many minutes do we have? Four. Four. Zero is John Brown. Soulful, youthful, respectful, mindful.
accessible, natural, humble, environmental, purposeful, gentle, fragile, equal, peaceful, joyful. These elements of consciousness are not radical, they're livable. Yeah, we are made of stars, so it's okay that we're not stars. Roses you are, roses I am. To reach the stars, the light helps. We're beginning to organize for it. We are our own light, we are roses, earth connected. We are our own light, our roots are wildly woven. And we are humbled to be called to help her. Our own light, soulful youthful, our own light, respectful, mindful, our own light, accessible, natural. We are our own light, humble, environmental. We are our own light, purposeful, gentle. Our own light, fragile, equal. We are our own light, peaceful, joyful. We're about to bloom, rose field, global. There's an awake group growing inside the parade. We want to hear them speak. They've got something to say. Indignation opposing the grand charade. We want to know their dream broadcast from the main stage. Yes, there's an awake voice growing inside the parade. We need to hear them before. It's too little, too late. Collapse from within is not a set in stone fate. The dream limit is to be exceeded. The dream limit is to be disobeyed. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Martin said on March 25th and 66, and we love and remember him to this day. The media is the most powerful entity on earth they have the power to make. The innocent guilty and the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. El Haj Malik El Shabazz, otherwise known as the great Malcolm X said, and we love and remember him to this day. There's no way to explain what happened that day. It's too much, but we will try. Though the words that we heard will burn all ears, and what we saw will spur all eyes. Two of the greatest kings we've ever known gone before their time. We, the masses of earth, refuse to enable the devil to decide our death or our life. So, Mr. Prevaricator in Chief, we pray for you each and every day. But we're not going to take your place when it's time to walk the plate. There's a court calling your name, and we all know it's more powerful than the Hague. This is a call to all we the people, lead, follow, or get the extinction out of our way. One of the uh, most important movies that I can remember that, uh, you know, it's arguable that Hollywood has a negative or positive impact on the history of the country, but I would say uh, they really hit a high watermark in 1969 with a movie called Easy Rider. This was a script that was labored over several times before they finally came to the final conclusion. And here's one of the scenes in it that still transcends to this day for people all over the world. It's a conversation between Billy and George. They're scared, man. They're scared. Oh, they're not scared of you. They're scared of what you represent to them. Hey, man, all we represent to them is somebody who needs a haircut. Oh no, what you represent to them is freedom. What the hell's wrong with freedom? That's what it's all about. Oh yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about, all right. But talking about it and being it, that's two different things. I mean, it's real hard to be free when you're bought and sold in the marketplace. Of course, don't ever tell anybody that they're not free, because they're going to get real busy killing and maiming to prove to you that they are. Oh yeah, they're going to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you about individual freedom. But if they see a free individual, it's going to scare them. Well, don't make them running scared. No, it makes them dangerous. Eat, eat, neat, 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 swamp. <laughs> yeah, right, swamp. Thank you, Charlie, for reminding us not to succumb to the power of the swamp. A couple of previous speakers alluded to it, but probably one of the most, if you talk about revolutionary actions, uh, probably one of the most revolutionary things that took place in this country over the past 100, 150 years was the GI Bill of Rights. Yes. Am I just going to pay you? By the stroke of a pen, 
The President of the United States was, was able to create a large middle class. Guys whose chances of becoming doctors or lawyers or college graduates of any sort suddenly became reality for them because the United States was going to show its gratitude by giving these people an opportunity uh, to uh, go to school, better themselves, and to this day, their families, their children and their children's children are still benefiting from that. It would be great if it hadn't taken a major war to make that kind of thing happen. But it did. And if I had my druthers, and if we had a president and a government that would listen to the citizens, I would suggest that the thing we need to do now is resurrect the Bill of Rights, the GI Bill of Rights, only a Bill of Rights for everyone. It's been touched on where people have said college for everyone. Uh, this is, you know, this is fine. It's, you know, if we want to consider ourselves to be the best country on earth, the greatest opportunities on earth, we have got to start taking steps to make that a reality. Education is going to be the key in the future. Not just high tech, but you know, lawyers, agricultural uh, work, the whole thing. But it can only be done with the assistance, indeed the fanatical assistance, of a government that seeks to do for its people what no government in the past has been able or willing to do. We indeed have the opportunity to truly become the greatest nation on earth. I don't mean the one with the largest navy, we have that already. I don't mean the one with the largest army, we have close to that already. I'm talking about a country that does for its people for the sake of uplifting a whole nation. This is the kind of thing that Lyndon Johnson talked about but wasn't able to make a reality. This is the kind of thing that JFK talked about but was cut down far too early before it could become a reality. I would hope that whoever becomes the next president of the United States is the type of person who wants to truly become a national hero by raising the standards, the living standards of an entire nation so that, you know, we don't have to envy the next guy. We are the next guy. And this is the kind of thing that we should be talking to our congressmen and our senators right now because I have a sneaking hunch the next president of the United States is not going to be Mr. Trump. Indeed, I have a sneaking hunch and indeed a hope that the presidential march hail to the chief, in this case, becomes jail to the chief. Thank you. He is. He is. Well, that's going to be hard to follow, but uh, Pat nailed it on uh, several different issues. I'd like to uh, add a few things quickly, uh, great moments in history where uh, things happened that weren't necessarily covered by the media, but uh, had a profound change on the way governments, especially ours, uh, look at things. In 1967, at a press conference, the nuclear uh, proponents estimated that the best safety record you could achieve was one reactor accident, like uh, Chernobyl, every thousand years with reactor service. Well, they looked at a chart on the wall, they said 1,600 reactors run by the year 2000, and somebody asked this guy a question, one of the reporters is, in the year 2000, what is that going to mean? He said, well, this is 1967, you have to understand that by the year 2000, America is going to be overpopulated enough that the public is just going to have to get used to one blast a year and a few thousand dead in exchange for cheap electricity. Yeah. They thought we would absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange for cheap electricity. Just uh, 
<clears throat> have a 20 mile square fenced off area as a national sacrifice zone. We could absorb one a year. 1970, the students at Kent State, uh, watching some of their classmates get fired upon and killed by the National Guard. That was a major change in our country. <clears throat> and the Vietnam War came to an end really, really quick. Shortly after that, as uh, students started mobilizing. 1972, this was not reported in the media, to the best of my knowledge, it's in books. Our Navy, uh, just like cell phones and VCRs get better and better, well, our Navy was getting sonar that was better and better and could track things deeper down in the water. Before that, when something, it was hard to track submarines if they were fairly deep. <clears throat> submarines were safe in World War II, relatively, compared to now. Well, in 72, off the coast of Florida, the Navy had a training uh, group out there. They were like 100 miles out there in deep water. And they log out of this bogey. They thought, well, this is a training mission, mission to uh, follow Russian submarines. Except this submarine they logged onto was going four times faster than our best nukes underwater. It was like 150 miles an hour back and forth, down to 20,000 feet. They tried this thing for four days. And then after that, they, they'd log on to these things periodically. Underwater, they're called underwater uh, unidentified objects. When they come up slowly and look like a whale is coming out of the water a little bit, then they come up a little higher. Ship captains have been reporting these things for centuries. They'll come up out of the water around a ship, take a slow lap around a ship, and fly off at 3,000 miles an hour. 1972 marked the absolute confirmation that there's a, a third body of submarines that aren't Russians, aren't Americans, and they don't know which race has them, but it's, it's an alien race, and they, their bases are on the bottom of the ocean. 1975, in November of 1975, this was a game changer. The government nuclear emergency search team uh, was hunting for a, a, a terrorist nuclear bomb supposedly planted on Union Oil property in Los Angeles. <clears throat> they, they have the Nest team, their, their, their job is to drive through a city with uh, white vans. Uh, don't alarm the public at all, just see if you can find and defuse any terrorist nuke before it goes off. They made the decision not to tell the American people about the hunt for nuclear weapons in our cities until they actually didn't find one and defuse it before it went off and we lost a chunk of the city. They decided, well, some, some American city could follow Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the history books, but that's a small price to pay for having a viable nuclear power industry, nuclear electricity nationwide, because those two industries are linked. 1979, of course, Charlie mentioned Three Mile Island. Some people think that wasn't a disaster. The reality is just the opposite. Read the works of Harvey Wasserman. <coughs> a whole bunch of people died, and a lot of people got cancer, all kinds of stuff, downwind uh, from New Three Mile Island. 1983, a man named T.K. Jones, Thomas K. Jones, came from Boeing Aircraft and was installed by President Reagan as the Under Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Operations. His job was to fly around the country and convince business leaders who were getting a little nervous. There's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and dig his own foxhole. <laughs> you dig a trench out back, put a couple of doors on it, and, and pile up a pile of dirt at least three feet high. Then you crawl into that trench, you sit under that big mound of dirt, it will shield you from the radio back and clouds drifting over after a nuclear exchange. Physicians for Social Responsibility got moving and they said, oh crap, there goes our golf playing on Wednesdays. we got to start educating the public. But this, this man is not in an insane asylum somewhere. He's in the president's cabinet. T.K. Jones is what we call an example of insanity on the hoof, prime beef, as it were. And the doctors published hundreds of books all around the world and educated the public about the, the real hazards of nuclear war. No, prime pork prime beef. But um, 1985, uh, Reagan God and the Bomb was published by a Canadian uh, named uh, Fred Nelman. And he spelled out the five-year plan from 82 to 87 to finance two trillion dollars worth of hardware, build that two trillion dollars of hardware, employ, deploy it all around the Soviet Union with fast-moving low-to-the-ground cruise missiles and launch a first strike in the summer of 87 
and get rid of the Soviet Union once and for all in what was called fulfilling Bible prophecy. Reagan was uh, supported by Jerry Falwell was holding Bible prophecy meetings in the Pentagon to teach our generals how to read the end time signs of the Middle East War. Uh, to know the proper moment, day and hour to launch in the spring of 87 and fulfill God's prophecy. One, I had a landlord that wanted to evict my brother and I. We were renting a house. She says, you're working for a clean, green future? You're working for, for peace? You're opposed to nuclear war? You're a tool of the devil. You're Satan's spawn. I want you out of here. But she went to a church in Palatine and was teaching, you're evil if you're opposing the upcoming nuclear war, which is God's plan for America. Great moments in history that have changed the, the thinking of people. And of course, in 1983, maybe of you have seen a movie called War Games with Matthew Broderick. Yeah. That was reality in the summer of 1987. There were so many UFOs flying through the radar of both America and Russia. <clears throat> they were Gorbachev and Reagan were on the phone every other day uh, trying to uh, shout down a red alert. He said, well, it's not ours, not yours. And they finally, Gorbachev pulled back and they shut down their computer launch hardware system first. And then, give me another minute. Uh, I'm, I'm wrapping up. 2001, of course, seven buildings were destroyed in a great real estate fraud in New York, and the media sold it to us as a terrorist attack by crazy Muslims to create a new Pearl Harbor, and the rest is history on that one. 2000, 2002, uh, eight years of Bush Cheney, that was the greatest, most concentrated transfer of wealth upward into billionaires, the greatest corporate criminal okay. crime spree no, no. in the history of eight our country. Eight minutes, Andy. Okay. One last thing, 2016, many of uh, we, a lot of us know, but a lot of us haven't yet recognized that a giant middle finger shaped like a, a large orange human being was installed in our White House to masquerade as our president. And a lot of the public hasn't come to grips with that yet. So that's where we are. Thank you. All right. I want to preface my remarks about the GI Bill of Rights and how it came to be. Um, what people f seem to forget is that yeah, President Truman was a veteran of World War I. So he, he saw firsthand what it does to a society when you have a whole bunch of unemployed soldiers, you know, coming out of, you know, uh, Germany. The result, you know, the increase in fascism, you know, in Germany, and he wanted to prevent that. So he went ahead and created the GI Bill of Rights, which produced the greatest increase in the middle age that we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Um, I would also want to add, this is where the uh, the personal becomes political. My, my father became disabled uh, in the 1960s due with a, because of a psychiatric disorder. He got services from the VA administration. After his release, you know, we were able to, to qualify for disability benefits. Back at that time, children also received a little bit of assistance. You know, this is a consequence of, you know, of the Great Society programs, which also had a profound impact, you know, on the further development of the middle class. Because a combination of that, plus the availability of student grants and student loans allowed me to build a foundation to go and complete college. As a consequence of that, I was able to find a professional job. Now, we have been in poverty for decades before that. I can't think in a recent time something that hasn't had a profound effect. Even the women's movement had, had a profound effect on me. You know, the Greek culture isn't exactly the most tolerant culture of all. 
sometimes I grew up thinking that they invented misogyny. You know, going 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 to the going to the home country of Greece and one one elderly woman says, You have to believe that this is a man's world and I thought to myself, the hell with that you know? And I just went ahead you know, all the difficulties I had at school, I just pushed ahead anyway. On the basis of that, I was able to get a master's degree and now I enjoy a more secure requirement because these programs were put in place and now they are under attack. We are under attack economically. We are, we are under attack constitutionally. I would say right now we have the most dangerous president that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Yeah. Trump makes, you know, Richard Nixon look like a Boy Scout. Yeah. He, does. He, just make, he just makes the rules as he comes along. What kind of crap, you know, is there out there when, when he deliberately breaks the law with Congress and release that damn report. I wouldn't trust that man right now if he said them. The sky was blue, and that's all I've got to say. Hi. Um, I'm going to talk about something that maybe not everybody's going to agree with. Um, Recently, um, <clears throat> Mueller in, um, concluded his investigation, and they actually found no collusion between Trump and his, and again, and his administration and the Russians. Now, <clears throat> I think it has absolutely been crazy what has been going on in the past couple of years with this obsessive focus on you know, Trump in collusion with the Russians. I mean, it is, it is absolutely insane. Um, oh. The media has spent endless, endless hours speculating, basically talking bullshit about nothing. With you know, I mean, I, it, it's like the uh, what was that woman, Chandra Levy, the woman who died, and they spent like a million. You know, they spent endless hours talking about nothing. If you have nothing to say, move on to another topic. Um, Rachel, Rachel Maddow makes $10 million a year, okay? Um, I don't know whether it's NBC or CNN. I heard that they haven't talked about Yemen for a year. They haven't talked about Yemen for a year because they're so goddamn focused on the collusion issue, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think there is like, there's a total, there's a collapse of our media standards. And it's just for, filled with all this junk. Talk about the real issues. You know, I actually, I'm sure Trump is involved in a lot of corruption, a lot of bad things. But don't focus on what we don't know and speculate about it endlessly. I mean, it's. I suppose if you don't care about Yemen, if you don't care about, um, you know, other issues like the fact you're trying to take away our health care. You know, then you can just focus endlessly on on Trump and collusion, which which isn't which isn't a reality. Um, so it, it's just just um, a symptom, or maybe it's not a symptom, but it, it's an example of how our media is collapsing. It's a very serious situation. Thank you. Charlie, you get the last word. Oh, oh. Charlie gets the last word. Oh, all right. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, he's back. He's back. I'm just going to say a quick thing I forgot to say earlier. Uh, somebody here had the audacity to call our president, Donald Trump, an asshole. And I just want to say that I think that that's an immensely insensitive and insulting thing to say um, for all assholes. All right, Charlie. All right, thank you very much. You guys didn't seem to have much objection here. Uh, regarding the interstate highway system, there are two things mentioned that I always thought about the car. It was the car culture that, that when, when I was going to talk about. Um, 
the interstate highway system was a military project. Um, so Eisenhower, uh, to, for preparation for warfare, I don't know if that's a change we should celebrate, you know, getting, make, making certain we can transport armies around the country, you know, uh, you talk about oppression by government, you know. Um, yeah, but you have to think about technology. Uh, yeah, the car culture is a, uh, probably more central to it. I try to avoid technology because I am surprised. Uh, it would be light bulb or refrigeration. Or my number one technological change that brought about change is the oscillating fan. I think that's the most important thing because it cools you off and you can think, you know, definitely the oscillating fan. Regarding aviation, aviation, I'm sorry, is, um, is possibly the worst thing to happen in this country. Uh, it does nothing but uh, dispense, we've had that particular matter. <laughs> through our skies, it's like flying gas yes stations. Each, each jet airplane distributes more pollution than all the leaves of grass on Earth. And there's millions of airplanes up there. I like the fly boys, they're kind of cool. But, you know, it's, it's a militarization, it's a, it's, a, it's a tool of the military. Um, uh, I don't know if that's the you know. Now the other thing is regarding aviation and the interstate is, I actually I actually had a thing, but in terms of transportation, I was going to celebrate the change was the invention of the mass public transit. So I think I'm gonna, that now that's a change that has affected more lives, more positively than sitting cars sitting in 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 a row in a traffic jam or this airplane stuff, flyboy stuff. Um, no, I, and I, but I said, uh, but you gotta avoid technology, that's kind of an easy one and this kind of stuff. Let's see what else. I, I'm sorry, young lady, the collusion, I've worked many campaigns. I was a federal employee. If I had any activity with a foreign government or foreign agents, first thing is you, you know, the question I used to ask in disciplinary matters was, what did you do next? That's the question I want. Because I said, what did you do next? When you came and encountered something like this, when they were confronted by Soviet agents, representatives of the foreign government, and every campaign, as lawyers, and believe you me, I've been in enough campaigns, and we had, even the Green Party, had, you know, you have uh, campaign lawyers on voting laws and to say that you do not give an advice. This is where the real thing is. They're telling me the lawyers of that campaign didn't say you, you should not be engaging in any activities in this nature whatsoever. It is totally and absolutely prohibited and against the law. And the thing is always says, what did you do next? When you approached and did you report it? And it doesn't mean I'm a snitch, but there are occasions and yes, you have an obligation to do so. Otherwise, you are co committing the crime. And there's clear evidence of that. Anybody that knows in a campaign, there's do's and don'ts, and what you don't, and believe you me, that you shouldn't be in the business. And these guys were so far over the line, and yeah, it is, you know, I'm, I'm that's right there. The, 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 the fact that they, you know, I mean, to throw an election, why bother we vote? You know, if, if, if they made a concerted effort, violated, broke the law in the process, and and say, and then to win fraudulently, then to claim victory, you know, it's not, you know, I like dirty trips, believe you me. I love men campaigns, they're cool, they're fun. That's not how you win. You know, that, they may have some peripheral stuff. But when it comes down to, you have to buy by the law. And uh, I'll tell you this much, anybody who violated the election laws like this would not get the endorsement of the independent voters of Illinois, that's for sure. No way, shape or form. We had lawyers in the, in, the, in the organization. They would never go along with this. You'd never go near it. If you can't follow basic election laws, 
you shouldn't be anywhere near this activity. That's what we minimally expect. Otherwise, it's the, the process makes no effort. Anyhow, thanks a lot. I'd love to play. All right. Thanks, Charlie. Wait a minute. Okay. All right. I vote for the Asseline, and we're adjourned.